This is Strange Love After Hours. I'm your host, Cami Chaos. Welcome, babies. Good evening, and welcome to a very special, a little bit different episode of Strange Love Live. As always, I'm your host, Cami Chaos. But this week, instead of focusing on tech, we're going to be looking at some fantastic art that is showing right now at A Space in Portland. But before I get to that, I'm going to say hello to Dr. Normal behind the desk. Hey, everybody. How's it going? How you doing, Dr. Normal? Uh, I'm doing okay. We got a special uh, episode. Uh, Really excited about it. Do you think that we're ready to introduce them to our artist in residence? Uh, I do think we are, yes. This evening we're joined by Mark Coleman. Hello. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm good. It's been a while since we've had you on the show. It's been a long time. Yeah. Things have been happening. Things have been going on. Things have been wonderful. Yeah? Yeah. And this week, yesterday, you opened a show at an interesting space because it's not really an art gallery it's kind of a tech workshop creative frenetic energy zone at pi yes it's it's widen and kennedy's portland incubator experiment mm-hmm. how did that get going well i actually went there they had some art there first thursday last month mm-hmm. and i said to uh that bacon-loving boy, Scott Cavitin. I said, Scott, you know, really, you should show some of my art. And he said, okay, let's do it. Yeah. That easy. It's a fantastic space. It is. It's a beautiful space. High ceilings. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Uh, it's a good place to show some large-scale art. Which I'm doing. Yeah. It's a great location, right around the corner from Wyden Kennedy. Mm-hmm. So you're showing some things that you've worked on for a while, but also some new things. I don't know... I'm not sure uh, how well versed our audience is with your art and what you do, but you started off as a commercial photographer. Yeah, I actually started off in fashion. Mm-hmm. I lived in Italy, lived in Spain, worked in fashion for 10 years. And I found that um, I really wasn't able to express myself creatively as fully as I would like to. Mm-hmm. Even though fashion photography is very creative, I kind of always wanted to take it further and further. And uh, that led me to doing my own fine artwork. Mm-hmm. And that's what this show is about. Yeah, it's my fine art stuff, which uh, I've been doing for about 20 years now. But you also have some clients that allow you to express yourself that way? Yeah, I work with uh, a lot of musicians. I just did some work with Adrian Ballou, which was very creative, and uh, he let me go crazy. I think, and you've done some, I mean, this is the second time you've collaborated with him? Yeah, I've worked with him on actually like three different projects, yeah. but I've worked with the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Jethro Tull, mm-hmm. Porcupine Tree. I think a I lot used of some of your Jethro Tull examples that's right in the Nick Knight presentation that yes I have. we have pulled some um some pieces and i want to make sure that everyone watching understands very clearly that we're going to show you some images but it's nothing like seeing them on the large scale uh that you could see at pi right now so if you have a chance to go down to pi i think we're going to try to set something up if you missed uh first thursday you need to go down there and see these images on on a grander scale. Yeah, absolutely. I'm showing some 50-inch tall prints. Yeah. So I think maybe, Dr. Normal, could you pull up the first Adrian Blue print? So this is uh, some work that you were doing for the new album. Yeah, Adrian Ballou just came out with a new album called E, Mm -hmm. and um, he pretty much gave me uh, total creative freedom, and I spent a month every single day working eight plus hours a day on a whole series of images of Adrian and it's uh, power trio. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, I kind of had some artistic breakthroughs and uh, did what I always do with my art. I try to go beyond what I've done before and always do something different. Mm -hmm. Don't always just do what I know, but go beyond that each time. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the process? I mean, you start as a standard photographer. You Yeah, I actually shot, uh, photographed the band Mm -hmm. and uh, pretty much straight photography. I actually used a film camera to shoot the band. Not digital. Not digital. 
although I did digitally manipulate it later. Mm -hmm. And I, I generally combine, you know, different things with the band. I do some very strange, uh, very strange things to them. I try to make, uh, sometimes I try to make them look really good, mm -hmm. better than real life. And sometimes I make them look like hell because it's fun. <laughs> Because you like to mess with people. Yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this image that's up right now? That's actually an image of uh, his power trio. That's the band. And uh, it's just part of a series that uh, I did of them. And I tried to do something that would uh, kind of represent their connection to the music and how they play together. Mm -hmm. Because they, this album is all instrumental and they're mm -hmm. very much a band. So I um, tried to show their inner connections, not just on a surface level, but inside um is that particular i know some of this work is on display at pi is yeah, that piece that piece is there and there's about uh, 10 pieces of, that i did in this series so 10 pieces in the adrian blue power trio series yeah are on display and they're pretty wildly diverse i want dr normal to pull, pull up um i looked at all of the of the ones that you showed me I don't, is this one on display as well? Yes, that is. This was my favorite because it kind of reminded me of the devil in a tarot deck. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely, uh, you know, found the uh, the inner Satan in Adrian. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a technique I actually just developed with this project mm -hmm. by, you know, doing things that I haven't done before and exploring new areas. So how did you get from the raw image to, well, it's a long involved process. I kind of get lost in uh, experimenting mm -hmm. and I literally I will do it for eight hours or more nonstop. So it's a it's a continual evolvement. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll try one thing. I'll try different things together and I'll continually build up things and save things as I go and uh, listen to the music. I tried to be inspired by, you know, the music. So you had the music to start with. Yeah, he gave me some roughs of the CD before it was finished, mm -hmm. and uh, I used that as inspiration. And I'm a huge fan of his work, too. So these images, I should note, are digitally manipulated. Yes, and these are the all digitally we'll manipulated. And some of the images later or not. Right. I started doing this uh, in the early 90s, actually the late 80s, way before I had a computer, mm -hmm. and uh, I developed my techniques on a purely photographic basis, which basically is just layering film. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I do that with Photoshop now, too. It's not that different. So it's Photoshop that you use? Are there any other programs? No. no? It's strictly Photoshop. I love That's Photoshop. That's what I've always used. I wish I could do with Photoshop what you do with Photoshop, but... Well, you, you, maybe you need to uh, chemically enhance yourself. <laughs> that could help. Good times, baby. <laughs> Good times. So to move from having that freedom, uh, you know, of having him say, okay, here's the music. Right. Take the photos and and work your magic. Do what do what Mark does best. Yeah. And then to move on to what you do. I mean, even with that, it's still restrictive because you're still doing something for a specific cause. You're, you've got it's a true. purpose behind it. Yeah, and you pretty much always know that people, most people, like to look good mm -hmm. in images. So you have to take that in consideration. Mm -hmm. And I do that. But in order to do that, sometimes I have to do the Those opposite. Those are flattering images. I have to let myself, uh, you know, make them look freaky and strange and scary. And You, you know, can look freaky, strange, and scary and still be beautiful, though. Yeah, And I totally. think you do a good job of illustrating that. Thanks. But I try to do both ways. It's, it's easier for me to... Uh, break the rules and do what I'm not supposed to do. And then that allows me to go ahead and do what maybe I'm supposed to do. Speaking of breaking some rules, he had a little friend for a while. I don't know if he was so much a friend as he was, you know, kind of nipping at your heels, but whatever happened to Cram Namlock? Oh, Did Cram Namlock. Him? Yeah, I got a postcard. Uh, he's down in uh, Cuba with Bundini Brown, his best friend. Mm hmm Smoking cigars on the beach and hanging out with the pimps and the host. Oh, look, it's Cram. Ah, oh, there's Cram, the handsome man. He uh, he crashed. The first time you were on our show, he crashed ah. the show and came on for a few minutes. All right. I and think you were in the restroom or something. I'm not sure what happened. I'm but... not surprised. He's a man of style and finesse. Yes, he is. But I, I, I believe that he stressed that if you wanted to break a rule, you needed to understand the rules first. Absolutely. You yeah. have to know what the rules are in order to break them. Is that something that you agree with? Totally. I mean, there's a lot of people that uh, don't really know what they're doing with photography. And to them, because they're new to it, they're cutting edge and wild. But uh, to someone who's been doing it a long time, then you just take it a little bit further. Yeah. So I think this would be a good opportunity to look at a few of the images that are 
um, going to be displayed at Pi, and for you to tell us a little bit about the uh, less technical, the less digital technique that you've been using for a while now. Sure. So let's have Dr. Normal pull up the first image that we have prepared. What's it called? This is called Fragile. Fragile. Yeah, and it's um, it's basically just two images put together, which is basically what I do. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times it's not so much um, the fact that it's two different images, it's that how they fit together. Mm -hmm. It's like they almost have to have a hinge point where they become one image, and it doesn't so much look like two different images. It doesn't. And it's, you know, it's, it's a very simple thing, but it's also very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. it, that is a very intimate and passionate piece. Thanks. That's yeah. one of my favorites out of the series. It... Yes. Dr. Normal and I have seen a lot of these in the past, and we were very lucky. I'll tell you when we get to my favorite. My favorite is a newer one that I hadn't seen before today. But we were lucky to be able to kind of pull our favorites as well as have uh, Mark guide us through the ones that he would like to look at. So... Take us through kind of what you're thinking when you put together a piece like that, when it's just for you, when it's just mm -hmm. something that you're creating because you love it. Well, really what I do is I just kind of get in a zone. I listen mm -hmm. to music and I get lost in it and I, I just experiment. I try thing after thing after thing. And uh, sometimes it comes together real easily. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I can go for days and uh, create a lot of garbage, <laughs> you know. What kind of music do you listen to when you're working on uh, I pieces listen to for a, you. a lot of different things, like um, Brian Eno ambient music, mm -hmm. sometimes King Crimson, sometimes Tool. Mm -hmm. listen to a band called Porcupine Tree a lot. Porcupine Tree. Osric Tentacles, just very, uh, you know, kind of strange atmospheric music that can uh, take you places. I listen to Robert Fripp a lot. Mm -hmm. I have no idea who Robert Fripp is. He's uh, an amazing guitarist. <laughs> Dr. Norm was laughing at me. I recognize all the other names. Yeah. Um, well, he's played with David Bowie. Uh, Heroes, the I solo should... in the song Heroes is I Robert Fripp. I love David Bowie. He's uh, the leader of King Crimson. And he's, he's oh. this virtuoso guitarist that even though he's 60 no, you some say odd King years Crimson old. And my brain finally registers yeah. why. Yeah. I mean, this guy still to this day, you know, practices his guitar three hours a day. Mm -hmm. And he'd rather do that than anything else. And he's just, he's uh, virtuoso. So you really get into the music, you get into the headspace that you need to be in, exactly. and then you kind of just delve into the art. Yeah, totally. I get lost in it. All right, Dr. Norman, you want to pull the next image? Now, this image is digitally manipulated, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's just doing what I do. I'm, you know, slicing up bodies and... Uh, you know, combining them with strange things and uh, turning in, them into something uh, different. It kind of reminds me of ham in a in a strange <laughs> sort of way. And it, that's a funny thing to say. I mean, you're a vegan. Yeah. So it's a strange thing to say to you. But that, I mean, it really does very much look like meat to me. Yeah. And I mean, in a glorious way, there's nothing, yeah. from my perspective, there's nothing wrong with meat. Right. Um, well, that kind of meat, there's not nothing wrong with that for sure. No. No, there's not. So how do you... I wouldn't call it that, but... I'm a girl. I'm allowed to say things that guys aren't allowed to say. That's this meat. Is true. Yeah. It's very attractive meat. There you go. Um, where were you going with that piece? Well, I was just trying to um, take her body to a, a different place than being round and curvy trying mm -hmm. to dissect it and uh, just playing with that's something that is a lot easier to do digitally than it would be with film mm -hmm. i appreciate i'm um, looking at this and i don't know if everyone grasps it as firmly you're not playing with the bodies of skinny little boy looking women you're, no. you're playing with the bodies of real women i mean yeah these are these are people that have definition and and curves and body and are human right. yeah and that's the kind of uh person i like to work with with my fine art because i work with so many models and actually she is a model but in the fashion you know they are so thin and it was mm -hmm. so freeing for me to work with real people mm -hmm. for my fine artwork mm -hmm. and you'll see um there's an image uh, in the show called fertility goddess that's mm -hmm. a woman that's nine months pregnant and she's uh i recognize very uh image. you know rotund and uh, uh kind of a um venus of willendorf Mm -hmm. type figure so was that last what was the last image called 
what was it called? Layers, I believe. Layers. Is that yeah. in the show? That is in the show, yeah. Dr. Normal, if you will. And I think Dr. Normal chose this one. Yeah, this is uh, this is a film-based image. Uh, the uh, model's actually shot in color infrared film. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a little bit of, uh, it's called Little Flower Girl, just a little bit of the softness of uh, femininity and uh, flower. I find it interesting that some of the images that I that resonate with me more are um, harsher and a little more abstract. And Dr. Normal seems to like the kind of the softer, more humane images. Why is that, Dr. Normal? I, I don't know. I just, uh, I just, uh, this, this. So it is a I, beautiful piece. Yeah, it, so it, what I liked about this image is that it looks like her, um, her legs are, are stained with the flower. And I just liked how there was no barrier between the flower and her body. And I, I, that's what I like about your work is if you just don't see the barrier, it's just right. one organic thing. Yeah. It, so, it becomes one. And I think later when we look at the graffiti, which is a little bit more edgy, I, I like, I, you have the same techniques there too. Mm -hmm. So, If I remember correctly, we could probably move just right into the next image, which is my favorite of the pieces that uh, we looked at. It, this one is not in the show. Right, it's not. And what is this one called? It's called Blue Tree Body. I'm not sure how well uh, they can make it out on the video, but if they go to the website, markcoleman.com, and they right. look, they should be able to, to inspect it a little more closely. Uh, are you comfortable telling the story you told us about this one earlier? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was in a, a juried fine art show, and uh, usually you never get to talk to the juror, but the mm -hmm. juror happened to be at the opening, and I actually had entered that piece and two others, and the other two got in the show, and this one didn't, and uh, the juror found this one offensive because she felt as though I was, like, impaling the woman with the tree. And I looked at it, and I I understand. Maybe Dr. Normal can pull it back up for me. I understand the implication of impalement, but I found that it was maybe a much more sensual impaling yeah. and a much more earthy, natural piece. I actually don't find anything offensive. I This is one of, of all the photos that I've looked at of yours. I love this piece. Thanks. I, mean, I think I, it's amazing. I see it as if you, if you think that way, then, you know, trees all over the world are impaling the sky. They are. So, I it's mean, true. there are lots of things you can get upset oh, those about. those damn trees. <laughs> they ruin everything. That's right. Just... Oh. All right. Uh, so, we've got one last image, and it is the most violent of the images that we've seen thus far today on the show. Yeah, this is a really interesting image. It's one of my favorites, actually, because... I've found that people see things in this image a lot of times that aren't there. Mm -hmm. And I don't really want to explain it too much because I don't want to rob people of their right to interpretation because whatever you see in a work of art, that's perfectly valid. And uh, But it's called Possession. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this one is on display at Pi right now. Yes, that is in the show. And how how big is this at Pi? Um, that's about 20 inches. It's not one of the huge ones. but I've uh, got to go look at it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, it's interesting to see it in person, too, because uh, you see, you tend to perceive things sometimes, um, you know, in, over time. At first, they'll see one thing, and then they'll they'll get kind of drawn into it, and then they'll mm -hmm. see maybe something else. So how many images did it take to create that one? That was only two images. Just two images? Yeah. And was there any special, I mean, was it shot blue? Yeah, it was. I lit the model with mm -hmm. uh, a blue gel over the light, mm -hmm. and uh, that was my intent to do that. I, although I didn't, I generally don't pre-vision everything I do in advance. I just try to set up a situation where I can create something within a certain framework without l limiting it to just one idea. Mm -hmm. But that one, you really, you had the feel for the color and the... Yeah. And so both images, I mean, did you have that particular outcome in mind when you shot no I, I really didn't and yeah. i was experimenting I was, I was experimenting instead of putting like say an image of nature with a body i put two bodies together mm -hmm. it's actually the same person in both of them 
Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, most people don't. Oh my, I'm going to have to, Dr. Normal is tapping his skull as though he did realize that. I have actually stared at that image. We have um, a magazine, the first time that you came on the show, you brought us. Right. That has that image in it. And I sat and stared at it for a good 30 minutes once because yeah. I was so perplexed. I, I didn't know whether to love or hate that image. Right. Because there's just something that really tears at you about that particular piece. Yeah. What I like about it is that it kind of tends to draw people in. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, maybe it does scare them to death mm -hmm. or... Uh, that's what I like to do. I like to draw people in and let them you, have a reaction. You want something. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, art should move you one way or the other. It should. Yeah. I I find it frightening, the ambivalence that a lot of people show towards art these days. Yeah, I do too. And I don't know if that's more reaction to the art that's being produced or the numb nature right. of people, but... It's our American culture, I'm afraid. I'm not fond of that. Yeah. I think most Americans can't name one single living artist, which is scary. Uh, I find it interesting that uh, I have a seven-year-old, mm -hmm. and we like to take her to the art museum. Yeah. And we like to take her, and, and not just the museum, galleries as well. We like to show her something that someone has created from nothing. Right. And allow her to absorb it and see what she thinks of it. And I have many acquaintances that will not take their child to the art museum because they do not think it's an appropriate atmosphere <laughs> because they're afraid that their child is going to disturb something. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I could understand, I, I could almost understand if they thought that something might disturb their child, but yeah. the fact that they think their child might disturb something. That's weird. I find strange because the museum is all about going and finding something yeah, and, and right. being stirred by it. And if you can't, have a child stirred by something. Yeah. How can you have the rest of society viewing something and totally and being a part of it? Um, and that's just my little soapbox moment. No, I totally agree. If you have I a mean, child, please for the uh, take them to go see art. Yeah, I think they have a free day at least once a month for for kids and families. Yeah. Pretty sure they do. And galleries all over the city. Yeah, absolutely. Have, are free all the time. So. Yeah, some of the some of the galleries have a better contemporary collection than the, the museum does. I hate to say it. Yeah, there are some things that you can find at the museum that you can't find. You know, right. there's a there's a broader range. Sure. At the yeah. museum, but that doesn't excuse you from taking people to see. Right. Uh, more isolated. Yeah, it's shows. nice to see living artists. There are more living artists in galleries than museums, unfortunately. Very true. Very true. I think we're going to move on to another set that's it's very far removed from the pieces that we just saw. And this is the graffiti series. Yeah, I was um, I lived in downtown L.A. for like 16 years before I moved to Portland two mm -hmm. years ago. And um, really, it's only I, been two years that you've been here. Yeah, only two years. It's such a short I'm, time. I'm a newbie. Oh, my yeah. goodness. It's such a short time. OK, so we're looking. What's this titled? Um, that was called Cram 06. If you Cram read 06. the graffiti that Cram has uh, signed in there some, somewhere. And um, I just got really interested in, um, when I first moved to downtown, I really didn't like graffiti. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I saw it like noise. And um, the more I lived with it, the more I liked it. And it became like, you know, my art and the, the kind of the best thing in the neighborhood I lived in was, you know, I can ride around and see the new graffiti and... Uh, so I thought, um, you know, graffiti artists are all about appropriating and sampling. So mm -hmm. uh, I sampled myself. Mm -hmm. And so that is digitally manipulated? Yeah, that's digital stuff. Yeah. And what? so you saw that, you thought about the sampling and the imagery, and you just kind of brought the two worlds together? Yeah, I mean, it was my life. I, I drove past this stuff every day and lived, you know, I used to plan my uh, route driving home around gang territory so I wouldn't get shot. <laughs> <laughs> that happened a couple uh, times. L.A. Yeah, it's a wonderful place. All right, Dr. Normal, you ready with the next piece? I think I might be moving quickly. Now, this uh, this model is the same model... From one of the more organic right. and, pieces. Yeah, and Little Flower Girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, the interesting thing about the graffiti stuff is I started uh, adding to the graffiti myself. So some mm -hmm. of the stuff in here is, is my graffiti. And I just kind of like the uh, the contrast between uh, the kind of vulnerable nude but 
not really vulnerable. She's about as vulnerable as Eve was. Yeah, and, she doesn't uh, seem vulnerable. She seems pretty tough to me in this piece. Yeah, there's some pretty interesting uh, juxtapositions with the graffiti and uh, the girl. What I find personally very interesting in it is that Dr. Normal was very much drawn to the little flower girl image. Yeah. It's the same model, and I immediately loved this piece when I saw it in the graffiti um, portfolio. Yeah. So I just thought it was very funny because... They are two such contrasting images. Yeah, they really are. This one's much harder. And uh, I love the colors in this one, too. There's mm -hmm. a lot of uh, really vibrant, contrasting colors, a lot mm -hmm. of red and turquoise. So when you were younger, mm -hmm. did you... When I grow up, I want to be an artist. I want to yeah, digitally was... manipulate photos. Well, I was always into art. And I always loved to draw, and I kept sketchbooks. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I did some basic Instamatic photography. And uh, actually, Instamatic? Do you mean Polaroid? Yeah, Polaroid yeah. and, uh, you know, 126 film, which was before you were born. I don't even know what that is. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to. <laughs> but, no, I used to love to do things like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, actually, I went into art school uh, and switched to photography because I was really slow at drawing. Mm-hmm. I would take these three-hour, you know, life drawing classes, and I have to come back at the end of the day and finish my drawing. So you so, just switched mediums? Yeah, because I didn't have the patience. Mm -hmm. And I still don't. No? Do you, the, do you enjoy drawing? Uh, no, it's no. hard. It's really hard. I don't have the patience for it. I really admire people that can draw. Um, I, I heard a quote today, and I'm not even going to, uh, to source it, but um, because uh, if... And it was, in, you know, implied in art. If it's not hard, then you're not doing it right. I think that's true up to a point, yeah. yeah. You need to learn to a certain level, but then it needs to be, uh, you it know, exciting. Flow. Yeah, and flow and be uh, an exploration, Yeah, which is what I always try to do. I agree. It's like a journey. We have one more image in the graffiti series. I saw my finger come up on the screen. It was kind of <laughs> creepy. And this is very different than the first two that we just saw. Yeah, this one's, if you can see this one in person, it's worth it. There's this a lot on going on. This is at Pi? This is at Pi, and uh, it's just a lot of deep uh, detail going on. It's like one of the most detailed pieces I've ever done. It kind of reminds me um, a little bit of... And I, I don't know, I don't know how... Uh... I'm not even sure in which way it reminds me of this, um, but it kind of reminds me of a Giger piece. Uh-huh, yeah. Because it just, I mean, the, the graffiti itself, when you look at it from a distance, it looks like a pile right. of something. Yeah. And, and I interpret it as a pile of ashes. Yeah, it has but, a lot of gray, and it's kind of metallic. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I can see it. It's a very cold piece, and... If you see the piece in person, the woman's face is kind of scary too. It's so, kind of ghostly. Yeah, when it's you look kind at of it erotic me. yet. Uh, you know, no, it's, it's a it's a very attractive. It's, erotic, it's a hot yet image. Scary, but scary. Yeah, yeah. You know, kind of like in The Shining. You know, where you have uh, what was that scene where we saw the woman in the bathtub and she turned into like an old hag? I saw that? The Shining once, but I don't remember. Yeah, that's another thing. I, I remember like the to twins. Do. Right. I, I like to, like, uh, you know, combine maybe something that might be a little erotic and make it terrifying. I actually really like that about a, a lot of your work. So I want to... Now this is a sensitive topic for a lot of people and for mm -hmm. artists maybe especially. You guys have to make a living somehow. And when you have art on display, most often it is yeah. also for sale. Right. But it's a little bit different... In this particular instance, you see, you go and you see these huge 50 inch pieces that cost, right. uh, you know, thousands of dollars just to produce the image, you know, not even considering what you sell it for. Right. And I want people to realize that they should be purchasing art, not even, yeah, they should go purchase Mark's art, but not God even forbid. that. <laughs> <laughs> they should be purchasing art. Oh, I'm so sorry. And now I'm kicking the guest. That's all right. But. It's a little bit different because if you go and you look at this beautiful 50-inch piece, it doesn't fit in your home. You can't afford it. It's not really the only option. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm selling uh, work in three different sizes. I'm doing like an 8 by 10, like 16 by 20, and the large pieces are 30 by 50 inches. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's three different price tiers. It's not super expensive. They're a limited edition. 
the large ones are additions of five, mm-hmm. and the smaller ones are additions of twenty-five. Mm-hmm. So it's affordable. Do making a living as an artist, mm-hmm. and you have more of a high profile than a lot of. You're not you're not a starving artist, right? But at some point, I'm guessing that you were. Yeah, sure. I've yeah. had lots of times. I mean, I I moved to Italy with knowing no one, mm-hmm. with a one way ticket, mm-hmm. and not speaking very good Italian. <laughs> so yeah, I had mornings where I would wake up there and I'd be just terrified because I'm like, you know, holy shit, what am I going to do? But yeah, I've had a lot of times. I've paid my dues for sure. Yeah. So what does it really take? I mean, people. You know, you've, oh, you've got to go to school. You've got to learn this. You've your business degree just to do all of these, you know, important things that people do. I sound so vague when I say that, but but my point is is that uh, people often think of artists as this kind of a flaky, flighty right. nature, yeah. and they're not really dedicating themselves to something. And I I think maybe it's that I want people to understand that the dedication is there even more so. Sure. Well, you know, I do commercial work as well, and mm-hmm. that's what I started in photography. I started doing commercial advertising and fashion. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I really realized, and it took me a long time, that, you know, what I really got into it for was to be creative. I didn't get into it to make money or to be rich or to have, you know, a huge house or to be famous or hang out with celebrities you did it or wear you beautiful it. clothes. Yeah, I did it because I love it and because I wanted to be creative. I wanted to explore that side and I wanted to do something that was truly unique and different. And uh, when I saw that I couldn't do that commercially, uh, I decided I'm going to do it on my own. Just you find know. a way. Yeah, but, you know, you kind of have to do the commercial stuff to pay for the art stuff. I think, you know, probably most artists do that to some degree, whether it's working a day job somewhere or whether they're doing commercial art. Um, I want to, a moment ago before these images, um, Dr. Norma pulled up a picture of Mark in a cemetery. You did a series of cemetery photos. You did a book. Yeah, I'm still, well. the book's still not done. I'm still working on the book. It's a three year project. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, it's one of those things, um, you know, when you, When you try to be really creative, you know, you do a certain kind of art. Sometimes it's very creative to not do that anymore and do something totally different. But it's a series of found objects in graveyards. Yeah, and it's straight black and white film. It's not manipulated at all. And it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, And there's Mark. Yeah, there I am in the snowpocalypse. From Don Park. That's right. That was shot in December or January. Yeah, that was uh, actually we called for a flash mob in uh, a blizzard, and only Don and a uh, hundred dollars showed up. Good people. <laughs> and me, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone, for the month of October, you can go right. to Pi if you can get them to let you in. Yes, it's we'll have more details. Twelve twenty-seven on that Northwest Davis, across from North Face. And it, it is the uh, White and Kennedy. Tech Think Tank. Yes. Incubator Experiment. In- yes. Portland Incubator Experiment. Now incorporating art. Now incorporating, as well they should be. Yes. So if you get a chance to head in there to see Mark's pieces, I encourage you to do so. Absolutely. You can also go to markcoleman.com, M-A-R-K-C-O-L-M-A-N.com, and take a look at and see what he's got on the website. Or you can follow him at K-R-A-M, Cram, on Twitter. That's right. Mark, thank you so much for yeah, joining thank us you, this Cammie. evening. It was really good to see yeah, you again. Yeah, enjoyed it. Great seeing you. Good night. Very night.
shot of the piece. If you were bored by the piece, then I would be upset. But since you weren't bored by it, at least you were offended. That's a good thing. This, that. So, so yeah, so not knowing the backstory behind this piece that Mark was kind enough to let me in on, um, it made me um, angry and disturbed and want to go beat somebody up because there's, there's the woman who, um, who's being held back by the, um, by the possessor. Because the, the piece is titled Possession, right? And then her face is that person's mouth. So that means then that, right, she has, she fails to have her own voice and she's only capable of iterating whatever it is the person that's possessing her allows her to speak, right? So, um, so yeah, so it's, um, it's enraging and disturbing and unattractive. Right. But the backstory is the backstory is that this this person and the evil person, the man behind her with the Fu Manchu mustache, is actually the same person. So it kind of gives it. A, if you know that, it's a little different. It does. It puts a totally different yeah. spin on the piece. There's no man in the picture, and it's the same person. And so possessing himself. So, or possessing part of herself, or a certain expression right, yeah. of herself. Totally. Uh, I can see that. Or maybe using herself, maybe using her body in a way that uh, maybe part of her represents. On that, I'm not going to comment. <laughs> and maybe not. 